Hi everyone, I'm Jerry Schumann, pastor here at Ludlow Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this video blesses and encourages you in your faith. And please consider sharing this on social media. Doing so is a strategic way that we're able to share the gospel with other people today. But before we begin, please keep this in mind. This video is not intended to be, and really it cannot be, a replacement for your commitment to a local church. God commands his people to gather regularly for worship and for fellowship under the leadership and the care of godly elders where the whole body is knit together and that's how the body grows and builds itself up in love. So nothing online can be a replacement for that. So if you're in the area, uh, come and join us for worship. We'd love to have you with us. If you're not nearby, please be sure that you are committed to a local, faithful, Bible-believing church. Thank you, and God bless. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that as we look at your word today, and as we do so on this Palm Sunday, that as we see the very sad and very negative example of your anointed in King Saul, that this might help us to see uh, how we greatly need a faithful, righteous king. That if we would have any hope, uh, that, that we must have a righteous king. And so I pray, Father, that as we look at this, that we not just see the negative example from Saul, that we would learn from him, that we take heed to him. But I pray, Father, more importantly, that we might see how Christ is the true and better king. He is the ultimate king. He is the righteous king. And Father, I pray that we might see his glory and we might see his goodness and his, and his faithfulness. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone here today that they have not bowed the knee and received Jesus as king, trusting in him, I pray, Father, that they might do so today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today is Palm Sunday, as you probably know. And this is also the beginning of what's often called Holy Week. And it's called Holy Week because the most significant actions that have ever taken place in the history of the world took place on this week that we commemorate. You have Palm Sunday on the Sunday before our Lord uh, died and then was raised. You have Good Friday uh, where our Lord laid down his life as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And then you have Resurrection Sunday, Easter, where our Lord conquered death, conquered over sin, conquered over the devil, and he is raised and alive forevermore. And I hope that as we're going into this week, that you've been praying that God might prepare your heart this week. We don't want to just blindly go into the week without thinking, without praying. I hope that you're praying this week that God might be working in your heart, that you might see the glory of Christ in a fresh way as we're gathering together as a people today, Friday as well, our Good Friday service, and then Sunday, our worship services then. And I, I'm also, also, we should be um, thinking about how we can be able to share the good news with those around us. How we can reach out to them and say, hey, come and join me. Come and join me for the sunrise service on uh, uh, next, next Sunday. Um, not sure if it's going to be outside the gazebo. That's to be determined. We'll see what happens throughout this week. Come, but come, come and join me. Or come and join me for the, for the service at 11 o'clock. We'd love to have you with us. Let, let's, let's be the people that have beautiful feet. Go to our friends and say, come and hear the greatest news in the world. Well, today is Palm Sunday. And this is the day in which we celebrate Jesus entering into Jeru in Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, and he's greeted by this massive crowd that are waving palm branches, hence the name Palm Sunday. And the palms are significant because they signal a triumphant, victorious Savior. Palms were used to signal a great conqueror coming back, victorious conqueror. They wave these palms. And so they're greeting Jesus as this mighty Savior. And then they also cry out, cry out with a loud voice. And they say, Hosanna, which means give salvation now. And then they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Now, this, what they're saying here, this is a quote from Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. And this is the end of what's called the Hallel Psalms. It goes from Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. And the Israelites, every year at the Feast of Booths, 
they would gather together in the early morning as they were gathered in Jerusalem. They gathered together and they'd sing the Hallel Psalms, starting in 113, working their way all the way up to Psalm 118, and it would climax with what this crowd says here. Hosanna, Lord save us, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so this helps us understand what this crowd is saying when they're making this acclamation of Christ. What are they saying? They're saying, the king that we've been longing for, the king that's been prophesied, the king that brings salvation, he has finally come. Here he is entering into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. This is this victorious, conquering king. And so that's what we're, say, we're celebrating today on this Palm Sunday. Now the question we should ask is, well, what does it mean for Jesus to be the king? Well, as we've gone through 1 Samuel, we've seen you can only understand the depth of what it means for Jesus to be the king if you look back at the Old Testament and you see what is the pattern and what are, what's, the, what's the requirements of what God's anointed one is to be. And as we look through 1 Samuel, we're coming to the very end of this book today. And what we've seen is 1 Samuel is all about the establishment of the monarchy in Israel. So what is it that we've seen so far in 1 Samuel? Let's review a little bit with what we've looked at since last May. Well, what we saw at the very beginning of 1 Samuel is that Yahweh, God, is the one true king. Not just over Israel, not just over his people, but over all peoples. We saw that at the very beginning when the Ark of the Covenant was taken away by the Philistines on account of Israel's sin. And the Ark of the Covenant, do you remember what that symbolized? It symbolized God reigning with his people. The mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant, overshadowed by the cherubim, that's a, a symbol of the throne of God. And so for the Philistines to have captured this Ark, it's a symbol that not only they've triumphed over Israel, but they've triumphed over Israel's God. But we see that's not the case at all. Because as the Ark is there, we see plagues come upon the Philistines. And they move the Ark and plagues continue to come upon wherever they move the ark and their god Dagon falls down and his head is cut off and his arms are cut off and what we're seeing is Yahweh is king over all. Yahweh is king over all. And Yahweh as the one true king, his purposes were that eventually he would set up a human ruler who would mediate his rule here on earth. He would bring about God's purposes for salvation and for judgment. But Israel they didn't wait for God's timing. They looked at the kings around them. They saw all the, all the enemies around them. And they said, we need to have a king like all the other nations to save us and deliver us rather than looking to God. And so in demanding a king, they are demanding a king in the place of God. And God, in his anger, gives them a king named Saul. Saul was greatly blessed by God. He was anointed by the prophet Samuel. The Holy Spirit came upon him. Saul started off pretty well, didn't he? But then we see he rebelled against God. He didn't live under the reign of God. And so because of his rebellion, God rejected him. And God's spirit was taken away from Saul. And then David was anointed as the next king uh, on, uh, for Israel. And when the Philistines came against Saul later in battle at the end of 1 Samuel, we see that in a panic, he consulted a medium. and God sent the spirit of Samuel, who was deceased at this point here, to come to Saul and to give him a message of judgment. And the message was this. Saul, God has turned away from you. God has become your enemy. And the next day, judgment will come upon you. Now that was chapter 28. We're in chapter 31, which is the next day. Chapters 29 and 30 actually goes backward in time a little bit. So we're picking up on chapter 28. It's the very next day. And what we see in this passage is the judgment of God upon his rebellious anointed one, King Saul. And this is given to us for two purposes. One, that we might see the judgment that comes from dishonoring God. We might see the judgment that comes from dishonoring God. And secondly, by way of contrast, that we might see the righteous king that Jesus is. So let's look today at the judgment that comes upon King Saul 
And then I have two points of application for us today, and one of them is relevant for today being Palm Sunday. So we see four aspects of God's judgment upon King Saul. And the first aspect of judgment that God brings is the army defeated and Israel, Israelites fleeing. So you remember back in chapter 28 that the Philistines and the Amalekites, they're encamped for battle near the Jezreel Valley. And Jordan, if you have the map, we'll pull it up right now. So they're encamped in the Jezreel Valley, which is right here. And we, the uh, Philistines were to the north. They were in a town called Shunem. It's not on the map here, but it's about right here. And then the uh, Israelites, they were on the south part of the Jezreel Valley uh, near Gilboa. That's where they were encamped. And the, the uh, battle initially takes place here in the Jezreel Valley. The Israelites, they're defeated in battle, and they flee back south to Mount Gilboa. So we see in verse 1, it says this, Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel, and, and the verb there, we're fighting, it implies a continuous action. So the idea here is we're, we're coming to the battle in action. It, it's already started. It's already begun. And what's the result? Well, verse 1, The men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. The verbs here throughout this chapter, they all signal a great and devastating defeat of the Israelites. The word fled is used four times throughout this chapter. In verse 1 and 4 and 5 and 8. And it's signaling their defeat is not um, the Philistines having some advantage. It is an absolute, it's, it, it's an absolute devastation in battle. And they're not only defeated, they're also routed. Verse 1 speaks of the Israelite soldiers fleeing in battle. But it's not only the soldiers. Look down at verse 7. It says, When the men of Israel, who were on the other side of the valley, uh, and what that means here is if they're gathered, they're gathered here at Gilboa, this is where Saul and his sons are defeated, the other side of the valley is the north side of the valley. So the Israelites up here, when they see that they're defeated, it says in verse 7 that they flee. They depart from their towns, depart from their houses, and then the Philistines, this is where the Philistines, uh, where, they, where they dwell, the Philistines end up dwelling in these towns that are forsaken by the Israelites. So this is an absolute rout of the Philistines over the people of God. And it's not just a rout, but this is the promised land. This is God's promised land that he's given, promised to the people of God. And so it's God's promised land that he's given to them. It's now been deserted, big portions of it. And the enemies of God, these idolatrous people, they're now dwelling in the promised land. And all of this is not some random event. It's not some bad luck in war. This is God's judgment upon King Saul. Look back at chapter 28 with what the prophet Samuel said to King Saul in verses 18 and 19. Chapter 28, starting in verse 18. It says, Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek, Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. So why is Israel defeated and routed in battle? King Saul's sin. It's his failure and judgment then reaches to the people. Now, we, we like to think of ourselves as Americans as autonomous. We're individuals, we're, we're autonomous, we're answerable to, to no one else, and, and we say, it, it doesn't, our actions don't really affect other people. It doesn't matter what you do as long as you're happy, and what does it matter if my actions aren't hurting other people? But what we see here is a reminder that this is not the way that God has set up the world. God has set up the world in covenant structures. And we see this again and again, that the action of one, especially the covenant head, has massive effects upon all those that they're in covenant with. We see it right away from the very beginning. Adam, he's the, the covenant head of the human race. He sins, and all the human race is plunged into sin with him. We all fell with Adam. We see it with households. 
the mother and the father have massive impact on the way, the direction of the home, but especially the father. Especially the father. Massive influence for good or for ill. If the father is unfaithful, if he's harsh, if he doesn't love the Lord, it has a huge impact on the direction of the kids, how they'll turn out. And if the father loves the Lord and serves the Lord and is obedient to the Lord, that's a huge impact on the direction of the kids. And we see with Israel here, the direction of the covenant head, the king, has a huge impact for the people of God. The actions of Israel's anointed one affect the people of God. And what this teaches us is that if the people of God would prosper, if we would be saved, if we would be blessed, then we need a righteous king. We need a righteous covenant head. Because as the king goes, so go the people of God. Now the second demonstration of judgment here is that Saul's sons lie slain in battle. We see in chapter 28 that part of God's judgment is that King Saul, uh, that his sons would perish. So look at chapter 31, turn back there and look at verse 2. It says, And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malkishua, the sons of Saul. So this was judgment upon King Saul. It's very possible that these sons, they would have been with their father, King Saul, in battle. And since King Saul's death is mentioned last, then it's very likely that King Saul would have seen Abinadab, Jonathan, Malkishua, all be slain in battle. This is part of the judgment upon King Saul. And we as fathers imagine the horror that this would be. Your son, slain. Your next son, slain. Your third son, slain. This is part of God's judgment, the heartache, the horror, the pain that would be gripping King Saul's heart. But it's not just the trauma here. There's something more with God's judgment, and that is the royal line of Saul. These sons, they would have been reigning next in line, Jonathan first. But one is slain, two is slain, three is slain. There's only one son left, and his name is Ishbosheth. We're going to read about him in 2 Samuel. He ends up reigning in the place of King Saul for only two years until he also is killed. And so in Saul's three sons dying, this is God devastating Saul's royal line. This is confirming God's word that he had given to Saul back in 1 Samuel 13, 14, when God said, your kingdom, speaking of your royal line, shall not continue. It shall not continue. Saul's royal heritage is nearly completely wiped out here. And then the third thing we see is Saul's shameful death in verses 3 and 7. So part of God's judgment here is not just that Saul dies, but it's the way that he dies. There are honorable, glorious ways to die, to lay down your life, and there are shameful ways to lay down your life. And Saul is demonstrated as a very shameful way of dying. And we see this in two ways. The first is he pleads for euthanasia. He makes a plea for euthanasia. Look, in, look at verse 4. So actually starting in verse 3. So the battle pressed hard against Saul. The archers found him and he was badly wounded by the archers. So he's, he's badly wounded. He's perhaps mortally wounded. He can't keep fighting. He also can't flee. And so he then turns to his armor bearer and he says this in verse 4. Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. So he's, he's pleading to his armor bearer, put me out of my misery. Kill me right now. Now, this is a plea for euthanasia. And, and euthanasia, uh, it, what it means literally, euphemistically, is good death. You means good. Uh, thanasia from thanos, it means death. Good death. And euthanasia, in modern settings, it's where a physician causes a consenting patient's death, usually to put an end to their pain and suffering. Now, to be clear, euthanasia is not the termination of care. It's the termination of life. There's a distinction there. It's not the termination of care. It's the termination of life. So, for example, if someone is very sick, if they have terminal cancer uh, and uh, if they have terminal cancer, it's not euthanasia 
for chemo or radiation to not be pursued. That, that's, not, that's not euthanasia. That's just choosing not to have that treatment. That's not putting uh, someone's life to an end. Or if someone is uh, very sick and they are on a ventilator and there's no human hope for recovery, it's not wrong if the family prayerfully, tearfully says, I think it's time to remove him from the ventilator. That's not causing, actively causing that person's death. That's simply removing the care from them. But euthanasia is not the removal of care. It is putting the extinguishment of life. And this is what's happening here in, in 1 Samuel 31. Saul is mortally wounded. He's in a lot of pain. He sees no hope for the future. And he commands his armor bearer, put me to death. End my life. Now, euthanasia has been legal in Vermont since 2013. So for 11 years now, euthanasia has been legal. And a few months ago, I read a heartbreaking article online of a lady named uh, Linda Bluestein, and she's from Connecticut, and she had terminal cancer, and she did not wish for the illness to take her life. And so what she did in the remaining years of her life is she pushed to expand access to the Vermont law that those terminally ill can end their lives via lethal injection. Originally, it was only for Vermont residents, but she pushed hard for years that it would include uh, out-of-state residences uh, so that she could be able to pursue this. And so a few months ago, she traveled up to Vermont and she was euthanized. And in the article, it read this. On Thursday, surrounded by her family, Blue Stein ended her life by taking prescribed medication. Her husband, Paul, said her last words were, I'm so happy I don't have to suffer anymore. The whole article is so incredibly sad. It's sad to see of the suffering of this woman. It's sad to see of her lack of hope for the future. It's sad to see that our state is a destination for this kind of a thing. And, and these issues are heartbreaking, but with any issue, we need to say, what does God say about this? What does God say about this? And we see a hint in our passage. So King Saul, he commands his armor bearer, put me to death. I have no hope for the future. I'm in incredible pain. I'm probably near death that way. Just put me to death. How does the armor bearer respond? Look what it says in verse 4. But his armor bearer would not for he feared greatly. Now, why did the armor bearer fear greatly? It's not because he was afraid of putting someone to death. This is a soldier, and not just a soldier, he's the armor bearer of the king. This man has put many people to death. Why is he fearing? It's because he's fearful of putting out his hand against the Lord's anointed and actively putting him to death. He knows it's wrong, and so he refuses to do it. And we actually see this confirmed in the very next chapter. So in, in 2 Samuel 1, we read of an Amalekite that comes to King David. And he brings what he thinks is going to be really good news. That he saw Saul mortally wounded, lying on his sword. And Saul cried out to him, uh, put me to death, put me out of my misery. And the Amalekite does so. He strikes him down and then he brings uh, the crown and some, some articles of, of, uh, of royal, royal clothing there to David to prove it. And David, he hears all this. He doesn't commend him. He doesn't praise him. He orders his own men to put this Amalekite to death. And he says this in 2 Samuel 1.16. Your blood be on your head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. What we see here is to kill someone who's mortally ill, even if they're in great pain, even if there seems like there's no hope for the future for any kind of a recovery, is to shed innocent blood. It's a violation of the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. God's word says it's the Lord who gives life and it's the Lord who takes life. And we do not have the prerogative to demand someone else, even a doctor, put me to death because I don't have any hope for the future. We must not think that our lives are only valuable if we are in good health. It doesn't matter if we lose our mental capacity or we're bedbound or we're in chronic pain. Your life matters because you bear the image of God. And it's wrong to pay someone else to actively kill us. 
That's, that's asking that they take the place of God and put our lives to an end. It's a violation of the sixth commandment. And we should pray for God's mercy on our state that we are so defiant that we have not only legalized euthanasia, but we've made it a travel destination for local states. We should say, God, be merciful to us for the shedding of innocent blood in our state. So it's shameful that King Saul is saying, put me to death, murder me. The second way that we see his death being shameful is he commits suicide. So when his armor bearer, when he saw his armor bearer would not kill him, we read in verse 4, Therefore Saul took his own sword and he fell upon it. And this here is a shameful way for him to die. This is suicide. And we see six instances of suicide in scripture. We see Abimelech, the son of Gideon. We see Ahithophel, David's counselor, who ended up betraying and going to Absalom. We see Saul. We see Saul's armor bearer as well in our passage. We see Zimri, the king of Israel, who committed suicide. And most famously, or infamously, we see Judas Iscariot, who killed himself after he betrayed our Lord. And in every one of those instances, it is presented as a shameful, dishonorable way for them to end their lives. And it's shameful, not because of the tragic circumstances that led them to take their own lives. That's not why it's shameful. It's shameful because what they're doing is morally wrong. It's wrong for us to ask others to take our lives. It's also wrong for us to take our own lives. That also is a violation of the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. When we commit suicide, we are murdering ourselves. Here's what Matthew Henry says. When Saul could not obtain the favor, that favor, he became his own executioner, thinking hereby to avoid shame. But running upon a heinous sin, and with it entailing upon his own name, a mark of perpetual infamy, a self-murderer. He's not wanting to be put to shame by the Philistines, but he ends up pursuing a path that's even more shameful. He is a self-murderer. We need to remember that God's law is a muzzle. It restrains us from evil. And sometimes people can feel so overwhelmed that they feel like suicide is the only way out. Life is so hopeless, it's so meaningless, it's so overwhelming. Suicide is the only way out. It's the only way out of this pit. But if they would know God's law, that we are not permitted to take our own lives, that that is no way out, that self-murder is still murder, then that realization would restrain a lot more suicide in our land. But sadly, in our land, we only view suicide in terms of them being a victim. That's not the way the scripture presents it. They are a victim in the sense that it's tragic and the circumstances are, 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 are very burdensome and it's, they're, they're, over, you know, they're just overcome with grief. In that sense, it, they are a victim, but they're not a victim in the sense that when they kill themselves, they're taking the place of God and they are violating the sixth commandment. And so Saul ends his life by shamefully killing himself. And a final demonstration of God's judgment is the shameful exposure of Saul's body. So King Saul, he dies, and then we see the Philistines brought great shame upon his dead body. So in verse 8, we read that when the Philistines came to strip the slain the next day, they found Saul and his three sons. And, and what they did here is horrific. They first cut off King Saul's head. And we read in 1 Chronicles 10 that they took his head back to Philistia and they placed it in the temple of their god, Dagon. Next, we read that they sent messengers, verse 9, to carry the good news throughout the land of the Philistines. Third, they put his armor in the temple of Ashtaroth, one of their fertility goddesses. And what they're saying here in doing this is they're saying that their false god has conquered over Saul. Not only has their false god conquered over Saul, but their false god has conquered over the God of Israel, the God of the Lord's anointed. Their false god has conquered over Yahweh himself. And then the, the, the fourth thing that they do is they take Saul's body and that of his sons, they strap them to the wall of Beth Shan, which is about three or four miles away from Mount Gilboa, and they, they chain up these bodies up to this wall in Bethshan to the shame of their defeat. And then birds of the air come 
and feed upon their corpses. This is the end of King Saul. And Matthew Henry says this, Never was a royal corpse so abused as his was. Never was a royal corpse so abused as his was. And the assumption behind all this is our bodies after we die matter. Our bodies after we die matter. Now we live in a Gnostic age where we think our bodies aren't really who we are. Our souls are who we are. And so when we die, it's like we're leaving our shell and our souls go and be with the Lord. Our bodies don't matter at all. The care of our bodies don't matter at all. But that's not what scripture says. Scripture says we are made in the image of God as a body soul composite. Adam made of the dust of the earth, the Lord breathes in him in his nostrils the breath of life. He is body, he is soul. Who we are is body and soul. Therefore, when we die, our bodies still matter. The care of our bodies still matter. They matter so much that our Lord Jesus, he rose again from the dead with his earthly body, and our ultimate hope as believers is what? It's the resurrection of our bodies. So the care of our bodies matters. And what we read in scripture is to have one's body exposed is listed as a curse from God. Let me repeat that. To have one's body exposed is a curse from God. Turn with me back to Deuteronomy 28. I want you to see what God's word says about what judgment will come upon Israel if they're unfaithful. So in Deuteronomy chapter 28, we read that if Israel does not obey the voice of the Lord, that all these curses shall come upon them. And one of the curses is found in verse 26. So Deuteronomy 28, verse 26. It says this, And your dead body shall be food for all birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth, and there shall be no one to frighten them away. Exposure of one's body to be feasted upon by the birds of the air, that's judgment from God. Saul is man judged of God. Now, our passage, mercifully, it ends a little bit on a positive note. So we read at the end that uh, in verse 11, the men of Jabesh-Gilead, we read about them. And, and this, is, this is a precious way to rescue the Lord's anointed from all the shame. Um, do you remember the men of Jabesh-Gilead? We've read about them in 1 Samuel. The men of Jabesh-Gilead were the ones who were oppressed by Nahash the Ammonite. And he said, I'm going to gouge out your eyes. I'm going to cut off your, your thumbs. And you're going to be my slaves forever. And they say, give us a little bit of time, please. Let us appeal to the king. So they appeal to King Saul. What does King Saul do? He comes in the power of the spirit. He opposes Nahash, the Ammonites. He slaughters them. And he rescues the men of Jabesh Gilead. Well, Jabesh Gilead, it's a town about 10 miles away from Beth Shan. They hear of the horror and the tragedy of what's happened to King Saul, and they say, we need to honor the Lord's anointed. So at night, they travel across the Jordan River, they travel the whole 10 miles, they, at great risk to their own lives, they take down their bodies, they bring them back to Jabesh Gilead, they burn their bodies, probably because they don't want the Philistines, who have, are all around there, to, to once again expose their bodies to great shame. They b burn their bodies, but they keep the bones intact, and, and then they bury the bones to give Saul and his sons an honorable burial. And so there's a little bit of honor given to Saul simply because he's the Lord's anointed. And this is the end of King Saul's life. So what do we learn from this passage of God's judgments upon King Saul? Well, we learn two things. Two things that we can take to heart today about what we learn in this passage. The first is this. See the folly of pursuing glory from man rather than glory from God. Saul is one of the most tragic characters in all of Scripture. Such great blessings that he was given from God, yet he hardened his heart against God, he rebelled against God, and he dies under the judgment of God. And he should be a warning to us of the dangers of seeking glory from man rather than glory from God. If you look at, at Saul's life, he devoted his whole life to pursuing glory from man. When he rebelled against God's word, he's valuing what he wanted more than what God wanted. When the women sang of David's triumph in battle, Saul has slain his thousands and David has slain his ten thousands, he's immediately jealous and he wants the glory for himself 
And this fuels him with this rage that causes him to pursue David for years and years and years, trying to put him to death. And even in our passage, his dying wish is that the Philistines would not dishonor him. Saul is consumed with the glory of man rather than living for the glory of God. And this is how he dies under God's judgment. Pursuing the glory of man and not the glory of God is the essence of what sin is. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is a failure to glorify God as we ought. And seeking the glory of man instead of the glory of God is what characterizes everybody who does not know God. In John 12, it says of those around Jesus, it says they loved the glory of man more than the glory of God. Whose glory do you seek? In your life, in your ambitions, in what you pursue in life, whose glory do you seek? Do you seek the glory of God? Or do you seek the glory of man? You might ask, well, how can I know if I seek the glory of God or if I seek the glory of man? Well, one good diagnostic question is, who are you trying to please in your life? Who do you try to please in your life? With what you do, with what you say, at your work, in your home, your interaction with other people, who are you trying to please? Are you trying to please others? Get their approval? Don't do things because you don't want their disapproval? It's all calculating. How can I get them to like me? How can I get their, how can I get recognition from man? Or is your number one aim, God, I want to please you. I want you to be honored in my life. I want to lift up your name. I want to live for you, my creator, my Lord, my savior. Who do you try to please in your life? Do you receive God's revelation found in his word as your ultimate authority? Or do you live by the shifting opinions of man? Do you receive God's word about your sin? That we are utterly sinful under the judgment of God? Or do you dismiss that and think, I'm a pretty good person? Do you receive God's son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior and publicly own him before others? You're not ashamed to identify with Christ. Or do you look at the idea of being a Christian, identifying with Christ, holding fast to the teachings of Christ? Do you view that as shameful? Do you please God by obeying his commands? Or do you spurn them and only do what's convenient? At the very beginning of 1 Samuel in chapter 2, you'll remember that verse that, uh, that, that comes from the mouth of God that I think is a, a theme verse throughout the book of 1st, 1st and 2nd Samuel. And it's where God says this, those who honor me, I will honor. Those who dishonor me will be lightly esteemed. Those who honor God, God's going to honor. But those who dishonor God, they will be lightly esteemed. Saul is a sobering example put before our eyes in all of his lowness, in all of his shamefulness. This is what happens if we live our lives dishonoring God. We ought not think that we can live our lives for the glory of man dishonoring God, and do that with impunity. God is not mocked. God is not mocked. If we live our lives to dishonor God, we shall be lightly esteemed. Secondly, what I want you to see by way of contrast is the glory of our righteous Messiah, King Jesus. What we've seen again and again in 1 Samuel is this. God's anointed as God's vice regent must be righteous. He must be righteous. And if he's not righteous, then he's not qualified to reign. And God's purposes for salvation will not be carried out. Brothers and sisters, on Palm Sunday, when Jesus is riding into Jerusalem and the crowd is lauding him, who are they receiving? Let's turn to Zechariah 9 and we'll close with this. Look at the passage that Claude read before the message here. Look at Zechariah 9, the prophecy given about this coming king. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Zechariah is the second to last book in the Old Testament. So Zechariah and Malachi. Listen to what it says in Zechariah 9, 9. This is, this is glorious. 
Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. What is the triumphal entry? It is the arrival of the righteous king. Jesus perfectly was obedient to God's word. He always did what's pleasing to God. And even in him coming to Jerusalem, what is he coming to do? He's coming to lay down his life on the cross five days later. He's coming to lay down his life as a sacrifice for sinners five days later. He's coming to lay down his life as a substitute for sinners in obedience to his father. Obedient to God to the point of death. He's the righteous king. And because he's righteous, he is qualified to bear the judgment of our sins on the cross. He's that lamb without blemish. And because he's righteous, death cannot hold him. Death cannot contain him. And so Jesus rises from the dead triumphantly on the third day. He is the righteous king. And the crowds cry out, Hosanna, bring salvation. These things are connected, aren't they? If he's not righteous, there's no salvation. If he's not righteous, he can't die for our sins. If he's not righteous, he won't rise again from the dead. But Jesus is this righteous king. And what ought to be our response? I think there's no better response than the beginning of verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Our righteous king has come. After all these years of waiting, the righteous king who brings God's purposes for salvation, he's come, brothers and sisters. He's come. After all these years of waiting, Saul, the Lord's anointed, was evil and rebellious and bore God's judgment. David was faithful, very faithful, and yet he sinned greatly. He's not the righteous one. Solomon, no, he's not the righteous one. Nor Rehoboam, nor Abijah, nor Asa, nor Jehoshaphat, nor Jehoram, nor Ahazi, nor Joash, nor, Am nor, nor Amaziah, nor Uzziah, nor Jotham, nor Ahaz, nor Hezekiah, nor Manasseh, nor Ammon, or Josiah, or Jehoaz, or Jehoiakim, or Jehoiakim, or Zedekiah. But it isn't Jesus. He's the righteous one. And because he's righteous, therefore he has brought salvation. So our response ought to be, rejoice greatly, shout aloud, our King has come. Let's pray. So Father in heaven, I pray that you'd help us to see the glory of what it is for the King to finally have come. This anointed one, this righteous one, this one who who is perfectly obedient, this one who brings salvation, this one who will mediate all your purposes, he has come. And Father, I pray that you'd help to work in our hearts, that we would praise his name more fervently, that we would rejoice in him. And Father, I pray that by the power of your spirit, that we would live our lives for the glory of God and not for the glory of man. May we honor you and so be honored by you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.